Campus. We are joined live in Los Angeles, beautiful Los Angeles, by Dr. Farah Alave. And so she is a systems engineer at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, one of the most storied and amazing research facilities in the entire world. Literally has been driving the space industry with amazing research uh, since its inception. And so as a systems engineer, she gets to build and test amazing robots that go to explore other worlds. Most recently in 2018, she's now working on a 2020 project. I don't want to steal her thunder, so I'm going to turn it over to her to blow our minds. And so without further ado, thank you so, so much for joining us, Dr. Alabe, and take it away. Yeah, thank you for uh, the introduction. So hi, everyone. Um, I'm Farah. Um, yeah, I'm somewhere outside LA. Uh, but uh, so today I wanted to give you a little bit of my background. Um, where I came from, how I ended up at NASA, and what I do now. But mostly I'm excited to hear about all your questions. Um, this is sort of a great program. When I was your age, I didn't really have access to uh, engineers and scientists. So I'm really excited to be able to share with you and then hopefully answer whatever questions you might have about space or becoming an engineer or even just how you get to follow the career you want to do. So I have a few cool pictures because you can't work in space without pictures. So I'm going to share with those with you now and then I'll come back on the camera later. So let me just get that started. Excellent. Let me know when it's all up. <laughs> and it should hopefully be up now. Can you Perfect. see my screen? Yep, you're Great. excellent. Um, Okay, so I've been working at JPL, the Jet Proportion Lab, which is out here in sunny California for now almost six years. And somehow I've only worked on Mars missions since I've joined JPL. Um, so I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about that. But first, a little bit about my background. Um, this is a picture of me when I was about five years old. Um, I was actually born in Canada, I was born in Montreal. Um, so I'm French speaking, that's my first language and I grew up uh, in a small town, let's say 45 minutes north of Montreal called Joliet, for any of you who may have been to Quebec before. Um, and in my town, working in aerospace wasn't really a thing that people did. Um, I, you know, people didn't really leave our town. We didn't really, it, I mean, no one spoke English. So it was kind of daunting to even think about working at NASA. What does that mean? Um, I heard about NASA because of a movie called Apollo 13. I don't know if any of you have seen it, uh, but it's a very realistic movie about, um, about uh, the Apollo 13 mission and the things that went wrong. And what I remember from that movie is engineers working together to solve really hard problems. And that was really appealing to me. I liked the idea of working in teams and solving hard problems. How could you not? So I sort of set my sights on working at NASA when I was about 10 which seemed ridiculous at the time. Um, but a few things happened in my life after that that helped me get there. So I ended up moving to England when I was a teenager. That's how I learned English. Um, but even then, I remember talking to, once you get to sort of like 10th or 11th grade, you, you, do, um, you get career advisors and you talk to your career advisors. And I, I remember I did a little online test and it came up with, I should either be an aerospace engineer or a doctor so I sat down with my, uh, with my career advisor and I was like, well, aerospace engineer, that's kind of cool, right? I, I can be an astronaut or something one day. And I remember her telling me, she looked at me and she said, well, you see, engineering, that's a male-dominated field. I don't really know if that's something that you should do. Maybe you should consider being a doctor. That's better. That way you can have a family. Well, when people tell me no, I usually do the opposite. But um, the, my, the lesson that I really, that I always share that story with people because um, for me, if I had listened to that person, I probably wouldn't be where I am today. So I decided to follow my gut in that, in that case. And I ended up um, going to the University of Cambridge and I did um, engineering there. And then I went on to do a PhD at MIT. So that picture there is one of the robots I worked on when I was at MIT. I'm also an aerospace engineer. And then the way I got my uh, foot in the door um, at NASA is that I actually did internships. So NASA in general and JPL has internships. Every summer we take on about 500 interns. Um, take about 50 high school students and then the rest are all college and graduate students. And that's how I got to know JPL. And, and when I was here, my first internship was back in 2012 and we landed the big Curiosity rover, which is the big rover that's on Mars right now. Um, and I saw that landing live from JPL and I thought, well, how can you not fall in love with this place? Um, so I ended up finishing my studies and going there. 
Let me give you a little bit of background of what JPL does. That big rover that you see on the screen, that's the rover that I was talking about that landed on Mars um, in uh, 2012. But what JPL does is that we explore the solar system. So we don't, unlike the other NASA centers, we don't do human missions. I don't interact with astronauts, unfortunately. I only interact with robots. But I have to tell you, robots are a lot easier to deal with because they don't breathe. You don't have to feed them. They don't poop. Um, they don't have feelings. So I like robots a lot. They listen to what I do, and they pretty much behave the way I expected them to. Um, so JPL is actually the center that launched the first um, satellite into space. That's the Explorer satellite, the first American satellite. Um, but since then, we've explored pretty much everywhere. We've gone to Jupiter, to Saturn. We've gone outside the solar system. We've gone to asteroids. Um, but the place we go to the most often is Mars, because Mars is the closest planet to us. And as it turns out, it's still hard to go to, but it's a little bit easier than the other planets. Um, so one of the missions that I was involved with when I joined JPL is the InSight lander. So this is a picture of the InSight lander here. So it's a lander, it doesn't move, it's a little boring, but um, it does cool things. So it has, it has a seismometer, and the seismometer is studying the interior of Mars, and I'll show you that in a second. Um, and it also has a probe that's currently digging down under the surface of Mars, and we're hoping that it's going to go down about 15 feet, so the deepest we've ever gone under another planet. Um, so the InSight lander, it launched in May of, um, so a little over a year and a half ago. So in May of 2018, and it landed, 2018, is that right? Yes, and then, uh, and then it landed on Mars last, um, last Thanksgiving. So it landed the Monday after Thanksgiving of um, 2018. So maybe when you were just back at school, maybe still full from Turkey, we were landing a robot on Mars. Um, and that was my first time landing a robot on Mars. And I got to be part of the team that built the instruments and accommodated them on the lander. And I also got to operate the spacecraft on Mars. Um, one really tricky thing with operating spacecraft on Mars is that um, the day on Mars is actually 24 and a half hours. So it's a little bit longer than your day um, on Earth. So on Earth, right, if you go to school, you're going to school maybe from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m., and that's fine. So you know every day you have to wake up at 6.30, brush your teeth, have your breakfast, get to work, you're there, well, get to school, and then you're there by 8, and you're there all day. And the evening you can make plans with your friends, right? You know you're going to be home by 4, and so on. Well, if you're working an 8 to 4 schedule on Mars, it works a little bit differently. Because the day is 24 and a half hours, it translates to a different time on Earth every day. So if I'm going to work 8 to 4 on Mars, Maybe on the Monday, I start at 8 o'clock. On a Tuesday, on Earth time, I'll be starting at 8.30. And then on Wednesday, 9 o'clock. And then 9.30. But then wait a month, a week or two later, and now I'm starting at 2 p.m. in the afternoon because my day has shifted so much to keep up with Mars time. So it's a little bit challenging that way that I have to work sort of what we call Mars time. Um, and I kind of had to keep two watches. I had to keep two clocks to make sure I always knew what time it was for my spacecraft. Um, so I knew when to go talk to it and go operate it on Mars. So, so some of the challenges of engineering that you don't really think of. But I told you a second ago that I would tell you what Insight does. Um, so maybe in school by now you might have learned that um, the Earth has a core and it has a, a mantle and it has a crust. Um, I don't know if you know this fact, but the crust on the Earth, which is the outer layer, it's the same layer as the skin on a tomato would be. So if you take a tomato and just look at the skin, that's how thick the Earth's crust is. And then everything else underneath is the mantle and the core and it's magma, and that's how you get volcanoes and things like that. And then on Earth, we also have tectonic plates. So we know that the crust isn't just one big crust, it's pieces that move around, and that's how you end up you know, with earthquakes. We're familiar with those here in, um, in California, but that's also how you get mountains, for example. Um, and we know that about Earth. We know about the interior of Earth, not because someone took Earth and cut it open. A lot of people can't do that. But we know that because of seismometers. It's basically because we study earthquakes. We know how earthquakes propagate. And that's how we study the interior of Mars. Think of it as if, you do it, if you've ever done an X-ray or if you've gone to a doctor and they've done, they've done an MRI. and they, um, they, You've probably seen X-rays of like your teeth when you go to the dentist. That uses waves to see inside your teeth, 
it's the same. We use waves to see inside the Earth. Um, so the way that we're studying the interior of Mars with insight is by looking at Mars quakes. We can't call them earthquakes because they're on Mars, so we call them Mars quakes. And that's how we study what the interior of Mars looks like, because we want to understand why it's different from Earth. What you might not know about Mars is Mars is about a third of the size of the Earth. It is a rocky planet, but it has the biggest volcano in the solar system. Olympus Mons is bigger than Mount Everest. Can you imagine a volcano that big? And it also has these big trenches, and it has one, a, a big canyon that if you put it over Earth, it would go from Los Angeles to New York, and it would be three times deeper than the Grand Canyon. If you've been to the Grand Canyon or seen pictures of the Grand Canyon, I've hiked down the Grand Canyon. I can tell you it's really deep. Um, so imagine something that's three times deeper on such a small planet. So there's something really weird going on with Mars. It's, it used to be much more active than Earth, and yet now it's pretty much dead. Um, that's what inside is studying there. Um, and let me show you, uh, I won't show you everything, but I'll show you one of the cool things I got to do um, as part of the mission is I got to go to the launch. Um, so once, the, once we got the spacecraft on the rocket, I was actually only a mile away from the pad when the launch happened. Um, however, um, this rocket was launched out of California. It's the first time we did an interplanetary launch out of California. And um, there's fog in California when you're, near, um, when you're near the ocean. So even though I was a mile away, I actually never saw the launch. I heard it and I felt it. If any of you have ever seen a rocket launch, um, it's, it's really loud, um, but I never saw it. And this picture was taken by one of my friends here in LA. Um, so as it turns out, sometimes you can see launches much better without being all that close to them. Um, so I'm gonna show you a quick video of what it looks like when you land um, when you land your, um, oh, hold on, I'm going to pause it first. So one of the hardest things of going to Mars is actually landing on Mars. So an interesting fact when you go to Mars is that the time it takes, so it takes six months to get from Earth to Mars. But then once you're at Mars, once you hit the atmosphere of Mars, and Mars does have an atmosphere, it's just really thin. It's about 1% of the Earth's atmosphere. So it's kind of it's enough to be annoying that you have to account for it, but not enough that it really helps you when you have a parachute. Um, but the moment it takes from the moment you hit the atmosphere to getting down on the ground is about seven minutes. And the time it takes for the signal to get from Mars to Earth is about seven minutes also, because it's so far that even with things traveling at the speed of light, it takes seven minutes. So you'll see here, the engineers are receiving the data in real time and what's interesting is that once you get that first bit of data that you're about seven minutes from the surface, the, sur the probe is actually already on Mars. Whether it's alive or dead, that's what we were trying to find out. So, oh, I just lost my screen. Oh, maybe, hold on one second. Take your time. <laughs> there we go. Can right. you, um, so yep. here's the video. So this was what we were doing. So once you hit the atmosphere, you can see we have this heat shield that slow that starts to slow us down and everyone's kind of looking nervous because if you imagine you've worked on this mission for maybe five or six years and there's your seven minutes we call them the seven minutes of terror then when we get about five miles from the surface we deploy a parachute um so we got the information that the parachute was deployed and the parachute does help us slow down but like i said we don't have much of an atmosphere so it slows us down um enough to uh enough that eventually, and eventually the crazy thing is we actually separate from our parachute. So imagine jumping from a plane and then cutting off your parachute, which is insane. But a few seconds later, I don't know if you saw, let me just go back a little bit. Um, there's these little retro rockets there. I'm gonna pause it. Um, see these little rockets there? Those are little retro rockets that help us slow down. And that's how we slow down to get to the surface of Mars. Um, but meanwhile, we're seeing data, come down and basically that last mile or so we go down on those rockets which if you think about it like this feels like forever um, and there we are coming down on the surface of Mars and when we come down on the surface we're already deployed already ready to go and then the next thing that happens is that we um, deploy our solar rays so so you'll see in a second how engineers react to landing on Mars it's pretty funny um, but it is a big event for us because you know, that whole team, we all work together to make those things happen. And so many things can go wrong when you land on Mars, but um, definitely that day so far has kind of been a, 
a highlight of my career. And we have people watching from all over. And that's one of the cool things. Actually, this year we had a 360 camera in our operations room for landing. Um, and we'll probably do the same when we land our next mission, which I'll tell you about in a second. Um, so there's really great ways to get involved in the missions, even when you're still in school. Um, so let me show you um, just a couple pictures of some of the work I get to do um, as an engineer. So I work in the control room. I worked on um, at the pad on the rocket itself. Uh, one of the cool things when we do work with our, there's the InSight lander behind me. That's me right there if you can't recognize me in, in my white suit. Um, but one of the things we have to do is we have to keep our spacecraft really clean. Um, so we have to dress up in these white, what we call bunny suits when we go work with our spacecraft in the clean room. Um, so definitely very different, um, different aspects to the same job. You know, people all, often ask me, what does your job look like on a day-to-day? -day? Well, it looks like this. It's, it can be very, very different. Um, so, you know, inside has been on Mars for almost a year now. Um, oh, and I wanted to show you actually really quickly before I go there. This is an example of how big a team can be. And actually, the inside team is, is very small. Um, so people often ask, what do I need to do to be an engineer? Do I need to be really good at math and physics? And, and I'm like, yeah, you know, math, physics, pretty important. Um, so is actually English and being having good presentation skills because you have to be able to communicate your ideas. But one of the most important things is actually being a good teammate and a good team player and a team worker because all of these big missions that we do, we do them as a team. No single human being can build a big rover or build a big spacecraft on their own. You can't do it. So usually you're working with large teams and you have to get along with everyone. So as an engineer or a scientist, if you want to do, or really anywhere, if you want to do anything cool and big, the one skill you really have to get good at is being a good friend and being a good team worker because that's, that's how you do the cool, complicated things. And then let me just give you a, a quick preview. I want to keep time for questions of the, the rover that I'm working on now. Um, this is the Mars 2020 rover. Um, it's a really, it's the biggest rover we've landed. It's about a little bit bigger than the Curiosity rover. It's going to uh, launch in um, July of 2020. And by the way, it's currently called Mars 2020. That's the, we'll call it a working title. There was actually a competition um, for uh, students to submit essays and names. I believe the competition's closed now. Um, and so we're actually going to be picking a name from a student entry uh, for the rover. So that's gonna be pretty exciting. Um, um, March 2020 is not a very exciting name. So I'm hoping that some of the students out there that wrote into us have better ideas for what we should call that rover. And uh, we're actually going to go to Mars. And so we're gonna land in February of 2021. So mark your calendars now. Um, I think it's about February 17, 2021, and I'm sure there'll be a live event for it, same for the launch. Um, and Mars 2020 is actually going to be collecting samples on the surface of Mars um, that we hope one day we'll be able to bring back to Earth. And my job on 2020 is actually pretty different from what I've done before. I work on the mobility system. So if you're familiar with maybe self-driving cars, um, well, our rover is self-driving. So I work on the system that helps the rover drive itself on Mars so that we don't have to tell it exactly where to go and it can figure out where to go. Um, so yeah, that's coming up very soon. So I wanted to leave you with that with a little bit of excitement of the next missions that are coming up. 